1 Samuel 18. We're continuing through a series on the life of David, and this next part is about relationships. He has these amazing relationships. I say amazing. They're, they're somewhere really odd. And this kind of works out perfectly because Valentine's Day is coming, right? And so Valentine's is that time of year where we're all giving out love to each other and chocolates and teddy bears and, you know, all of that. Any, like, wedding proposals coming? Someone going to surprise someone with a wedding proposal? <laughs> It'd be weird if you told me. It would be weird if you told me that. Now, for me, 20 years of marriage, it's, it's just a, a, you know, I'm a hero if I can make a dinner reservation. <laughs> so we've moved past chocolates and teddy bears, although I did buy some of your seized candy for your Mexico trip. But I'll eat those. <sighs> If you signed up for the marriage conference, you're already a hero. So if you, all of you that have done that, that's this Friday. We did buy a few extra spots. So if you still like to be a hero, then you can still sign up. Let me know. And then the rest of you, well, you know, it just may, next year maybe, right? Next year you can be a hero. I'm sorry. I'm getting a little off track. I also should say that it is a time of year that people have lost loved ones, there are divorce, there are separation, and for you, uh, this is not the greatest time of year, and that's real. That's very real. And one of the relationships we're, re we're going to really go into is the third one is the relationship with Jesus Christ and God and how, how that is the relationship that's going to trump all others. When we look at David's relationships that he shows in these next three chapters, he has this cantankerous relationship with Saul. Saul is a crazy person. I call him a, a psychopath, if you will, because at one time he will call in David and say, hey, I want you to play the lyre for me and a little harp action. I want you to just, you know, make me relax. And while he's playing it, he'll pick up a spear and try and chuck it at his head as hard as he can several times. This doesn't happen just once. It happens multiple times. That's a difficult relationship. That is a, that's a tough one. Uh, we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about Jonathan. Jonathan is Saul's son, and it's so interesting that someone that you might want to have an arm's sort of distance, he doesn't. He has this incredibly brotherhood love with Jonathan, and we're going to dig into that. And then I call the last one, he has a challenging relationship with God, because in the midst of what's happened, how is the next phase of his life probably his darkest valleys, most difficult, challenging times. Think about it this way. He's just been anointed by Samuel as the next king. Then as he goes up to his brothers, you know, he's door dashing cheese to his brothers. He's pulled into an, a, a, a war and he defeats Goliath. He must be in that moment thinking, I, I, this is it. That's it. Let's go. I'll be the youngest king of Israel. The army saw it. King Saul saw it. Like this is the moment. I just cut off Goliath's head. But that's not what happens next. What happens next is he begins to run for his life. He is chased by mob squads. It's just this incredible time of, you, you have to imagine him going through this moment of going, God, what in the world are you doing? How in the world, after everything that's just happened, is now the dark valley there? And now I'm circling and trying to figure out what's next. At one point, he goes into the city of Gath, which is where Goliath is from. It's a Philistine city. He acts like a crazy person so they don't kill him, just so he can get away from a crazy person of Saul. Like that's the situation he's in. He's probably in that moment going, God, what are you doing? All right, lean over to the person next to you and say, things don't always go the way we expect. It's true. There's a book I'm looking for. There's a book I'm looking for. I haven't found it yet. I've been searching my whole life for it. It's called How to Build a Table by Jesus Christ. If you ever see that book, I want you to buy it for me. I have this book. This is the last three years of Jesus' life, all right? It's pretty good. It's, it's top level. Like, I'd put it near the top of books. I want the first 30 years when he's in carpentry learning from his dad. I, I feel like there's so much of that life where he, you know, is waiting. And it's waiting and waiting and waiting. There's 30 plus years. We know a little bit from the beginning, but there's all this middle section where Jesus himself is in the growing period. 
and he's spending time with God. And he's probably waiting for this moment at year round 30 when boom, it all happens. There's so much of our life where we're waiting like that for that next move forward. We know God's doing something. David knows God is doing something. And yet we're going to have these chapters now where it's the most crazy part of his life. Let's go back to the psychopath, Saul. Why am I even saying that? So the reason I'm saying it like that is, first of all, we don't have choices sometimes with some of the relationships in our life. There's, there's some times in your life where someone's there and they're just going to be there. There's nothing you can do about it. I'm not going to point them out for you who they are in your family or friends, but there's that one relationship that's a little challenging. That's what happens to David. He can't run away from this. Verse Samuel 18, verse 2 says, From that day Saul kept David with him, did not let him return home to his family. I want to catch that right there. He, again, just came to deliver cheese. He's on a cheese run, and now he's stuck. And he can't go back to his dad. He can't go back to his sheep. He's stuck. And he's stuck. And the reason I use the word psychopath, I looked at it. It says this, disregard for laws and rules, violence towards animals, pathological liar, manipulative, lack of empathy, lack of remorse, lack of guilt, impulsive outbursts, like throwing spears at you randomly, refusal to accept responsibility for actions, that comes up, disregard for others' opinions or values, that comes up, selfishness, egocentricity, Failure to learn from experience. If you want a word to describe, or I guess a sentence to describe Saul, it's over and over he goes, oh yeah, you're right, I'm sorry. And almost asks forgiveness. And then the next verse goes back to exactly what he was doing before. That is the definition that we're looking at here. And that's a relationship David's stuck in and has to deal with it. And so we find ourselves asking the question, okay, how does David deal with this? How does David move forward in this? And what can I learn from it? Verse 6 says, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul. Okay, pretty good. They're singing, they're dancing, joyful songs, timbrels and lyras. As they dance, they sing, Saul has slain his thousands. Sounds wonderful, right? And David, his tens of thousands. And Saul's like, hey, wait a second. What? He's very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? It reminds me, so there was this, I was watching this I don't know what it was. It was some kind of monkey test. And there was two monkeys, and they're in these cages, and they have this circle, and there's rocks down here. And the scientist kind of like waits for the monkey to hand her a, a rock. And when he hands her the rock, he gives the monkey a cucumber. And the monkey's very happy, eats the cucumber. It's a beautiful moment. The monkey next to it, does the same thing, takes the rock, puts it out. The scientist hands that monkey, this is a famous test, by the way, you can actually go look this up, hands out a a grape to the second monkey, and apparently monkeys really like grapes. It was news to me, I had no idea, because all of a sudden that, that monkey is super excited about the grape. So the first monkey goes, oh, grabs a rock, puts it out there, very excited. The scientist gives that first monkey a cucumber. And that monkey lost its mind. <laughs> it, it took that cucumber, reached through the hole, and threw it at the scientists. No joke. You can go see this video. It bangs the table as hard as it can, grabs a rock, puts it out of the window. And so the scientist gives it a cucumber. That monkey lost its mind. It went, it went ballistic around the cage, shaking it. That's the definition of what's happening here with Saul. Like that whole test of monkeys is like the human race. I mean, it's just, it, I was just watching it going, oh my goodness, that is so us. It was fine with the cucumber. The cucumber was wonderful until I saw that that guy got a grape. And now I am so mad. That's what's happening with Saul. Saul's like thousands, yeah, I'll take it until 
David has tens of thousands, and from this point on, Saul loses his mind. Verse 10, the next day an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house. While David was playing the lyre as he usually did, Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I will pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. You know, David's playing medieval dodgeball <laughs> while this schizophrenic calling him in to sing or play the instrument is now trying to kill him. Imagine what's going through David's head. So put it all together. You know, anointed, kills Goliath in the king's house, spears being thrown at your head. It just gets worse and worse and worse. And what can we learn from this? What are the patterns that David shows us? Because there's patterns that we do as humans that we have to be super careful about. And there's patterns the Bible tells us in these moments of dealing with difficult relationships, how we should be responding. The first is this, he stays the course. This one fascinates me. I'm so impressed that David actually sticks around. We have a temptation when bad things happen to go, woe is me, to get into this dark hole, start spiraling down like, and my mom hates me and my dad hates me. Like we just keep going on the spiral and just keep adding to it. And my job's terrible and my kids are going, like maybe that's me, but I just spiral down this thing. I'm going to go, okay, we need to relax and stay the course that God's put me on. Verse 14 says this, In everything he did, he had great success, because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. So that person, that, that, that cantankerous relationship out there, actually can be more about their fear of you. And we have to think about that when we have these difficult, difficult problems, challenges in our life. But all Israel and Judah love David because... He led them in their campaigns. He continued to do whatever God had called him to do in that moment. He continued to move forward in the path that God had put him on. That is such a key to hold on to our life because there's so many times we're going to be spinning going, I don't understand why I'm in this situation right now. I don't understand why this is happening. Why am I in this holding pattern for so long? All of that happens over and over through many of the heroes of the Bible. And what do they do? Stay the course. He goes on from here. The king is actively trying to get the Philistines to kill David. He puts him in the front of these battles. Then when he's going to give his daughter to David because he killed Goliath, he says, I'll give her to him so that she will be a snare to him. That's an, uh, another whole situation. Then he doesn't actually give the daughter. He says, okay, I will give you this daughter, the one that he's already supposed to be getting, if you go and get a hundred foreskins from the Philistines. Weird requests. I don't understand the requests. But he does. He does. He goes and he gets 200 foreskins and brings it back to King Saul because, I don't know, it's just a fun activity for the day. <laughs> he just continues to move forward. He continues to stay the course. We can learn from this. Now, how is David feeling in the midst of it? Well, that's when you turn to Psalms. They're all over the Psalms. There's 150 Psalms. And I would say a good portion of them tell us exactly how he was feeling. Here's one, Psalms 13. It's a really short one. I grabbed that one. It says this, how long, Lord? Anyone ever said, how long, Lord? How long, Lord, are you going to forget me? Anyone ever say that? Are you going to keep forgetting me, Lord? How long are you going to hide your face? How long am I going to wrestle with my own thoughts and have this sorrow in my heart? How long are you going to let the enemy triumph over me? Look, look at me. Answer me, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I'm going to die. I'm going to sleep in death. And my enemy is going to say I have overcome him. And my foes, they're going to rejoice when I fall. Now that's real. That's David being real with God. The thing that separates David though is he adds this every single time. But I trust in your unfailing love. That's what separates him. Yeah, we can get mad at God. We can, we can struggle. 
We can have these moments. We can have these outbursts. Will we also stay the course and say, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart is going to continue to rejoice in your salvation. I'm going to sing your praise. You're good and you're good to me. Now that is someone who can stay the course. The second pattern I see is he's building healthy relationships in the midst of this. So he has an unhealthy one that he has no choice about. And in the midst of an unhealthy one, he can still build a healthy relationship. Now, I find that a a really special thing about him because we have a tendency to withdraw from people if one person hurts us. So we have a bad relationship, and so all of a sudden the whole world is full of terrible people, right? We have this weird sort of like, I'm going to become a recluse because the whole world's terrible when it's really like one really difficult relationship in our life. David presses in to the king's son, who he probably has, I I mean, it's not in scripture, but there's got to be a little bit of, I'm not sure this guy, he's he's the next to be the king. He's the second in command. Should this really be the person I connect with? Apparently he does. He has this incredibly close relationship. And in the next two chapters, we see loyalty, sacrifice, love, and pain. If you ever want to know how to build a healthy relationship, show loyalty, sacrifice, love, and pain. Be real with your emotions. Let's look at love. 1 Samuel 19, verse 1. Jonathan had taken a great liking to David and warned him. My father Saul, I'm sorry, we're looking at loyalty. (laughs) My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and I'll tell you what I find out. Again, this is like the second in command. This should be, this is the king's son who's probably going to take over the kingdom. What is he doing? Showing loyalty to David as the anointed one. And these two, instead of skeptical, they draw into each other. There's so many times where we're going to question people. We're not sure their real intention. Can we still press forward and show loyalty and say, you know what? Yeah, I might get hurt but I'm going to keep moving forward. I'm going to keep pressing in. 1 Samuel 20, verse 3 says this, But David took an oath and said, Your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Yet, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there's only a step between me and death. And Jonathan said to David, Whatever you want me to do, I will do. That's sacrifice. They're showing sacrifice. I had a buddy of mine, he was, he was in ministry with me, and I go, hey, I need you to, I need you to, I won't say the particulars, but it was basically, I need you to step up and do this particular thing with this person who needs you. And they said to me, you know, I just don't really want to be inconvenienced. And I, I laughed, at least and I laugh about this 20 years later, we're still make, we still make this joke when we ask each other to do something. I don't really want to be inconvenienced because it was such a weird thing that we, I've never heard someone say that before in ministry. I don't want to be inconvenienced. I'm like, all of life is an inconvenience. And there's not one scripture that says uh, life is supposed to be comfortable and full of riches. Kind of, but not the way you're talking about it. Have you ever read a documentary about anyone who had lots of riches in our world and how'd that turn out for them? It's never really a good situation. In fact, in the sacrifice is where you actually find joy. And scripture tells us that, we just don't believe it. But in sacrifice is when joy starts to appear. Let me explain. Like you're in the middle of a project. You know, we just had this big project here and you're almost near the end and you're looking around and you're seeing all the people that are helping and in it and with you and you kind of go, this is awesome. It's awesome to see this. Now when you started, it sounded like a big inconvenience. But as you got through it, you found the joy of what God was doing in the moment. It happens with the small group stuff. Small groups are nothing but inconveniences. You lose a night of the week. Got to figure out what your kids, you know, what you're going to do with your kids. You're kind of like that awkward when you show up with your plate of hot dogs. I mean, I brought hot dogs. I don't know. (laughs) Everything about it is just awkward. But if you'll go through the inconvenience 
and you grow in these friendships and relationships could change the rest of your life. And you start to like actually, like this is awesome, I have friends here now. But it took moving through the inconvenience so the whole concept of sacrifice, whether it's, you know, giving, giving's a big one for people. Once they do it, they're like, oh, this is cool. I get it now. But it's always an inconvenience when you start. Serving is that way. Reading the Bible. Obviously, we should read the Bible daily. But that's an inconvenience because our lives are just so important and so busy. But we finally start to do it and we go, what was I waiting for? 42 years it took me to finally start reading the Bible? You know, it's... My, hopefully I'm hitting someone's nerve at some point here. <laughs> All of life is an inconvenience. But in the sacrifices when we grow. How about love? Verse 16 of chapter 20 says, So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath to, for, of love to him because he loved him so much as he loved himself. We are so weirded out by this that I've heard people describe what's happening here like in the weirdest of ways. And I'm like, that's just because you don't understand love anymore. You can have brotherly love. We just turned it into how many likes we have on Facebook or my followers on Twitter. How many stars get on like Jimmy Fallon and go, I have 25 million followers. And you're like, I don't know what that means for you, but it means very little to me. I have, I don't know, 95% of the people who follow me, not that it's all that much, but I don't know who they are. That's our new love. That's our new reality. And it's not good that we call those friends. In fact, it's kind of weird in our world because I've heard this. If you have one really good friend, you are doing something. Like, you're amazing. That's sad, right? We should have lots of friends that are close. But it's only going to happen when you take your heart out of that thorny area that you've covered it with, with the foil and the, all the armed guards, and you pull that out and go, okay, I'm going to go ahead and open this up again and allow it to be hurt. That's hard because someone hurt it. But until you start doing that again, you're, you're missing out on the joy of this life. Yeah, it might get hurt again. I get it. I really do. But you got to keep putting it out there and going, love matters. And David shows us in the midst of an unhealthy relationship, I'm going to keep putting my heart out there and love, even if it's going to possibly get hurt again. And then he shows real emotion. This is another one really hard for us. Verse 41, after the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone, bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and they wept together, but David wept the most. Jonathan said to David, go in peace for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord saying, the Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. And then David left and Jonathan went back to the town. I don't want you know, a bunch of you kissing me after service. <laughs> but we can show love to each other, right? We can cry together. There's, no, there's so many times when we get your, your prayer request cards and we look at them and go, oh my, I don't, that is so hard. I don't even know what to say. I have no answer for what you're going through. But I'm just going to pray and cry and just keep being with you through it. Life is challenging, Will we open up our emotions and cry with each other and be with each other? That's what David does. In the midst of all of this question, he continues to say, I'm going to continue to love. I'm going to continue to show real emotion. I'm going to cry with you. The third thing I see is he draws even closer to God. Why is that so weird? Well, we tend to get mad and blame God when bad things happen. And then we can stay in that moment or we can draw even closer to God. We're all going to have the moment. We really are. We're all going to have the moment of, God, I'm just a little disappointed right now. We're going to have that moment. What you do next is what connects you to what David's saying here versus what the world says. The world's saying, give up on it, throw him out. This whole God thing, you're an idiot for following him in the first place. Or we can draw into what scripture says, draw into God and go, God, I'm gonna keep 
pressing forward in you. I'm going to go deeper with you. Everything has been just not working out, so I'm going in deeper. It's a tough thing to say. It's a tough thing to do. And the Psalms are full of David doing just that. I'm going to do one more. Verse 70, or chapter 77 of Psalms, verses 1 through 12. It's longer than this. The ending's when he switches. But here's where it starts. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out my untiring hands and I would not be comforted. Anyone have a night like that? You're stretching your hands out saying, God, why aren't you answering me? And I remembered you, God, and I groaned and I meditated and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about my former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor to me again? Anyone relate? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? And then I thought, this is David, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. I'm going to remember the deeds of the Lord. I'm going to remember the miracles of long ago. I'm going to consider all of your works. I'm going to meditate on your mighty deeds. And he goes on and on and on to say all the stuff he's going to do. I'm going to remember, God, all the victories from the past. I'm going to remember all your verses of hope. So yes, he is feeling terrible. Is it some kind of polynasm dreaming about who God is? No, it's saying, I am hurting God, but I'm going to go deeper. And I'm going to remember all that you are. And I'm going to recommit to you. I'm going to go deeper with you, even in the midst of the struggle. That's the next part we see in David's life. How are you doing with this? Do you need to recommit to him? Recommit to this moment saying, I got to go deeper. Yeah, I'm mad. And I'm going through a challenge and I'm struggling. And I'm going to go deeper. Instead of running away and being coming recluse, I'm going to love more. I'm going to stay the course that he called me to. Can you do that? Can you recommit to him and go deeper in the midst of the struggle? Romans 3.23 says this, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you're here today and you need to recommit your life, perhaps you're in that moment of needing to recommit your life. Uh, we've all been there in those kind of moments. We've all sinned. We've all said things we probably shouldn't have said to God. We've all had those moments of saying, God, I don't understand the waiting And Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we continue down that path, it does lead to death, but there is a gift. And so can we step back and go, but, but, I'm going to focus on Christ Jesus my Lord. I'm going to focus on the promises that I remember, the scripture you show me, the victories from the past. Romans 10, 9, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So whether this is a recommitment or a first time commitment, he says when you confess, when you confess, you will be saved. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in this room today and you need to recommit, it could be the first time or it could be a recommitment. But if that's you and you just need to do that, I'm not going to pull you up front or do anything weird, but I'd like to pray for you. Will you just raise your hand and say, that's me. Pray for me. Today is a day of recommitment. Just lift it up. Amen. Just lift it up. Amen. 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 Anyone else? If you're watching online, just put it in the comments.
Father, thank you for understanding us, understanding some of our doubt, some of our questions. I thank you, Lord, that you graft us in to your system of branches and your tree that goes deep with roots that are so deep that you can handle our struggle. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that we continue to grow and feed off of that. And even in our even in our challenging years, the times of drought, you still feed us. God, I thank you for that gift of life. And as we move to communion, we remember your cross. We remember Jesus. We remember the gift that you gave us in your son. We remember you, Jesus. The gift of the bread representing the body that was broken for us. The juice representing the blood that was poured out for us. You say that we will do it again with you someday. But until that day, we do this in remembrance of you. And so today, Lord, we take communion and remember the gift that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. 